You may have seen them. Tents set up near bridges or overpasses. Communities created by people living on the street. The issue of homelessness is far from a new problem, but homeless encampments are getting new attention as the arguments over what to do about them have gotten louder. As Austin voters weigh a camping ban proposition, Texas lawmakers are considering bills to prohibit homeless encampments across the state. But some are concerned the bill the state legislature passed will lead to criminalizing the homeless population. With a new state law banning encampments, plus the end to the federal eviction moratorium, rising rent and home costs, preventing and combating homelessness has never been a more pressing issue. But it's more than a policy debate. It's lives at stake. It's been rough the last couple of months. You personally feel a little boxed in in the house. We're survivors anyway, but, but we want to do better and we want to have something, something else. And the people dedicated to helping the homeless want the same. Every situation is so different. As much as I would love to say there's a, one solution, it's, it's such a complicated problem. In this episode of KSAT Explains, we're taking a closer look at the debate over homeless encampments. We'll hear from people experiencing homelessness and the people who are working hard every day to help them change that. KSAT Explains. KSAT Explains. KSAT Explains. KSAT Explains. in-depth perspective. Perspective on stories we bring you in our newscasts throughout the day. We're looking into concerns over voting safety during a pandemic and the battle over mail-in voting. A look at how the protests and demonstrations have played out in our city and an examination of what it means to be black in San Antonio. An issue that you have likely felt the effects of, rising property taxes. The roots of Tejano run deep in South Texas. We examine the cultural impact the music has had in San Antonio team is focusing on homeless encampments in the debate over whether to allow them. Thanks for joining us for this episode of KSAT Explains. I'm Myra Arthur. It can be a sensitive topic, homelessness, and how to address it. For more than a decade, KSAT has been covering how homelessness has changed in San Antonio and the resources that are now available to our community. But a new debate has emerged when it comes to homeless encampments. Some even call them tent cities. They're certainly more visible than individuals living on the street, and that visibility has helped fuel the conversation about whether they should be allowed. But does increased visibility mean an actual increase in homelessness in San Antonio? The data says no. Here's a look at the numbers of people experiencing homelessness from 2007 to 2020. The light blue represents those living on the streets. The dark blue is for those living in shelters. As you can see, for the past several years, those numbers have stayed relatively steady. The 2020 numbers show a total of about 2,900 people experiencing homelessness. That's up from just over 2,800 in 2019. That might be surprising. To many people, it certainly seems like there's been an increase in the number of tents that have popped up across town, under bridges and in empty parking lots. Rex Bryan, director of Rapid Rehousing and Prevention Services at SAM Ministries, attributes some of that to the pandemic. Shelters had to reduce capacity. Nonprofits weren't receiving funding, uh, or, or maybe they just sort of went away, those smaller agencies, you know, church pantries and stuff, because then it became about the whole community at that point. And, uh, you know, remember the lines from the food bank, you know, that picture's still very vivid in my mind. Um, you know, well, the, the folks we work with, um, you know, felt that impact too. Another reason for the increase in visibility, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention advised against clearing encampments during the pandemic to avoid the spread of COVID. The guidance says that sleeping in an encampment during a pandemic may allow people to distance in a way they wouldn't be able to in an emergency shelter. There's also fear about going into shelters and programming and being around other people. Despite that fear, Katie Vela, the executive director of South Alamo Regional Alliance for the Homeless, says that local shelters have not had any large outbreaks during the pandemic. Since we spoke to Vela, the Supreme Court ended the federal eviction moratorium. But even then, she told us local organizations were preparing for that. And that's why uh, we're launching a housing surge to try to house as many people experiencing homelessness as possible in the next few months to ensure our partner agencies have capacity to be ready to serve that need we expect to see in a few months. 
For some people living on the street, encampments may be where they choose to stay. A collection of tents, blankets, or other belongings, certainly more visible and getting more attention as a result. And some of that attention is in the form of enforcement. We went to one of the biggest encampments in San Antonio and talked to people about why they were there. And then days later, they were told to leave. When we met this man in early August, he'd been living in an encampment under I-37 near downtown San Antonio for more than a month. It's been rough the last couple of months. I don't really think everybody, anybody really want to live like this. Both across the country and in San Antonio, there has been an increase in people experiencing homelessness who live on the streets, also referred to as unsheltered homelessness. This year, the encampments those without shelter often end up in were banned statewide. A new law that goes into effect in September makes camping in an unapproved public place a Class C misdemeanor, punishable by a fine of up to $500. But here in San Antonio, a similar policy has been on the books since 2005. And while homeless providers in our area don't love sweeping mandates handed down by the state, the city doesn't anticipate the new ban will change much for them. But it is at officer's discretion, just like any other Class C misdemeanor or a speeding ticket, that sort of thing. The topic of penalizing people for living in encampments is a controversial one. Some argue it criminalizes mental health issues and poverty, the leading causes that result in people finding themselves out on the streets. If you get a citation for, um, and for living in an encampment, um, what's the likelihood that you can pay that citation? Very little, right? Um, and so then you go on from that citation and it amasses additional fines, late fees, so on and so forth um, until it's insurmountable. Um, that's the struggle with, um, with citing homelessness. But others argue that abatement or clearing these encampments is necessary as they can pose public safety and health risks. It's being run by people who may suffer from mental health issues themselves. Then sometimes you get a criminal element in there who um, takes money from some of our mentally ill and cognitively disabled clients and it's being run kind of like the, the Wild West. And that's not good for many people we serve. And that is what causes a lot of concern for us when we see especially larger encampments um, is, is that criminal uh, concern of that concentration of sort of vulnerable folks living on the streets. Patrick Steck, Assistant Director for the City's Department of Human Services, or DHS, says the city's approach to encampment abatement has always been to lead with outreach by helping to connect those living in encampments with the services that they need. This is how the abatement system currently works. When officials come across an encampment, DHS visits to assess the situation and offers services through homeless providers it partners with and other city departments. If during that assessment they find that the situation is a health and safety concern, they schedule an abatement, which means clearing out the encampment and hopefully finding somewhere else for people to go. This is typically done with the Public Works Department. DHS says they like to give people living in the encampments notice before clearing the area. The folks there always have at least 48 hours notice before this happens. Uh, typically even more notice is given, but 48 hours is our guideline. When we visited that encampment under I-37, we heard a lot of stories. This is Jonathan. He told us that he'd been staying with friends, moving from house to house before winding up in the encampment. Personally, I feel a little boxed in in the house and stuff. Since when I was younger, I always get locked up and stuff, so like, this was like a box to me now. So it feels a little more freer. This man says his criminal history has made getting on his feet more difficult. My main problem finding work after I lose a job is my background, my felony conviction. I haven't been in trouble since 2013, but they're still there. He also told us he's learned a lot living on the streets. I had, I had this certain view of the people down here till I ended up down here. But then I got down here, I met, I met a lot of these people and I've come to realize that I was wrong. The way I was thinking was wrong. Everybody might think they just do drugs or they just drink, but it's not really the case. This is where I'm supposed to be for right now. Um, somehow, some way, that's how I feel. I'm not really concerned with um, trying to hurry up his plan or whatever. 
I'm okay right now. In mid-August, not long after we talked to the city, that encampment, which is on land owned by TxDOT, was cleared, and it seemed to take local homeless providers by surprise. A spokesman for DHS said they did not know that TxDOT was moving forward with abatement until it was already in progress. TxDOT says that's not true. According to a spokeswoman, DHS was informed a week ahead of time. This is just one incident that illustrates how complicated a citywide coordinated response to homelessness can be and why multiple agencies across the city must work together to tackle the issue. Working together as street outreach providers uh, and, and collaborating and being on the same page, um, that's, that's, that's key. Uh, right now. Confusion aside, even people who work as homeless service providers have different thoughts on the effectiveness of abatement and ticketing. Homelessness isn't meant to be comfortable. If, if we're keeping them comfortable there, why would they ever go into shelter? They're not. Shelter, they have structure, they have rules. They're never going to want to transition into something else if we're keeping them comfortable in their tents. So I'm one where I am supportive of that. I think um, oftentimes people think that they're the, the the unsheltered homeless. They're drug abusers, they're lazy. Um, I don't necessarily know that that's always true. Um, I think that there is often distrust of the system um, as folks have been burned by the system in the past. The work that we are doing in terms of building relationship and rapport um, with the unsheltered is much more beneficial than um, a ticket or a citation. Just one week after the encampment was cleared in mid-August, we went back out to that spot under the highway where it had been. No tents had gone back up yet, but people had already begun to trickle back into that area. This issue is about far more than policy and procedure. It is about people, people facing a complex set of circumstances that are a struggle to overcome. But there are those trying to help. We spent time with local outreach workers who make it their mission to walk the streets of San Antonio, getting to know people experiencing homelessness. If you could uh, just kind of give us your position with Travis Park. So my name is Morgan Handley, and I am the Associate Director for, Tr for Corazon Ministries. Um, we are a nonprofit run through Travis Park Church. So we know them by name. That's one of the things that an outreach worker takes pride in, is I stop and I acknowledge them by name. They're not just some random person. I'm not just going to ignore them when I walk by, pretend I don't see them. Mm -hmm. I'm going to stop and recognize them for the person that they are. Good morning, Kenny. How are you? Pretty good. You having a good day? No, Staying dry? Not right now. I know. <laughs> I know. I figured you'd have something protecting your hair like you always do. Well, uh, I don't intend to go out in the rain that much. Right? Where are we at thinking about the apartment? Have you talked to Tiffany? Uh, oh, yeah. I've talked to some people about that. They said, uh, uh, I don't know when, but she said she was going to come by. And you're wanting something downtown, right? That's the yeah. deal. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And one of our goals was coming out in this inclement weather is that I'm going to catch them when they're ready. Yeah. Nobody likes to be soaked. Nobody likes to sit in the rain. Nobody likes to sit in the cold. So I'm hoping that that help brings them to the point where they're ready to accept help. How are you doing? Are you mad that you didn't get your morning coffee? Yeah. Yeah, I figured. How about some water or a snack? Morning. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. Hey, sugar pie. You ready? All right. Here. Oh. Oh, there we go. All right, sugar pie. Y'all rest it up. Okay. There you go. I'm here with Neville. We talked to one guy yesterday, but he loved to talk to you. Here. Okay. Here. How, how are you doing tonight? I'm gonna tie your other shoe. Here. I said, how are you doing tonight? Just this past year, I was able to 
after a lot of digging and investigating, um, find his family um, who loves him, didn't know where he was, um, and reuni reunified with him over the phone. And so we're on a mission to get him back to Zimbabwe with his family. He has a bachelor's degree. He's a very intelligent person. He's, he's from Africa. He's a veteran. Um, and he's trying to make it home to Africa to be with his family. They want him to come home. But with his untreated mental health, we can't put him on an airplane. So that's our, our latest struggle right now. They want him to come home. He talks to them. He FaceTimes them almost every day. And we're trying to figure out how do we get him back home safely. Uh, the air conditioning that works in... in oh, um... He's in such a good mood. Okay. So... Yeah, today I should, hopefully today I should be getting his documents from the embassy. And then I talked to Von Guy about you guys having another meeting about maybe our organization raising the money for all of this. So yeah, that's basically what he does all day, just back and forth. He'll stop and like right on the wall with his finger. Good days, bad days. When it comes to mental illness, how much of a, does that play into uh, the, the people that you sort of run into? It's, uh, it's, it's one of the biggest pieces. What's your name? I'm lost. What is it? I'm lost. Morgan. Nice to meet I'm you. Brittany. Nice to meet you. How's it going? Uh, all right. I saw you scooping up water earlier, watering the plants. That was sure nice. My family comes from my military background. Okay. So I do. Where where do you normally stay? Are you not normally downtown? No. Uh, really, we're just like I've been working on my diet. Exercise. So we have a day center, so we're street outreach workers, right? So we have a day center that you can come hang out at during the day and get a hot meal and a shower and all that good stuff. And then we can help figure out what um, your housing options are, get you off the street, whether it's shelter or a house or whatever, whatever it is. Okay? It'd be cool for you to come hang out with us. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah? First thing I noticed is he didn't have shoes, shoes. on. Yeah, that was yeah. the giveaway. And then the longer we stood there and watched him, and he was just pouring it into the plants, I was like, oh, okay, like there's probably something else going on here. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll see. We'll start from here. I'm really grateful for, uh, for our bike patrol, SAPD bike patrol and park police. So one of the things that I've noticed here is that like, if we have somebody suffering from withdrawals, we'll get a call from PD and say, hey, can you come help this person before they take mm -hmm. them to jail? You know, because that's, uh, locking people up and putting them in jail is not going to solve our problem. Hi, Robert. How's it going? Hi, how are you? I'm doing good. I know, it has been a while. Remind me your name again? Jenny. Jenny. All right, Jenny, it's nice to see you again. Being sober for a while. Um, Especially, so I don't see many AA books out here, so I just related to her, you know, and that's something that was really cool is when you, when I said, yeah, I've got seven and a half years, and she goes, oh, so I grabbed it and I highlighted one of the, one of my favorite parts of that book. They build families, right? So you have moms out here and dads out here and uncles out here, and they're not blood, right? But um, they don't want to leave their family. It'd be like me leaving my sister, my blood sister. That's how they feel out here. Bye, guys. We'll see y'all later. As you can tell, Brittany, Morgan, and Valerie work hard to make connections with people they meet on the street. They know better than anyone else the uniqueness of each person's background and their circumstances. And that's one of the most challenging parts of addressing homelessness. It's not always mental illness or substance abuse. Brina Monterosa explains the reasons a person can end up on the street are complex. Rhonda and Felix have been homeless for about a month. We've never been through a situation like this in our country, period. The couple used to live in a trailer along Roosevelt Avenue. Eventually, their home became unlivable, and they ended up on the streets. Most of their belongings are in storage. They're traveling with only what's necessary. On this day, street outreach workers with Sam Ministries talk with Rhonda and Felix to try to learn more about them. I'm 60, but I'm not getting the benefits I need. He's not getting his either. 
Okay. So I mean, that's something, that's something that we could definitely look at too. Sam Ministries has been serving the homeless and those at risk of becoming homeless for 38 years. It's not just the folks that you see on the corner who are panhandling um, or the, the, the people who um, are downtown living in encampments. Um, there are so many families and individuals, particularly um, in this time of the eviction moratorium, who don't understand what that means, um, who are doubling up with friends or family um, in this time until they have nowhere else to go. Nikisha Baker has served as president President and CEO of the organization for six years. We have been uh, doing street outreach work here in San Antonio for the last three years. That's when Alba Garcia joined the team as an outreach worker and clinical case manager. She says the job isn't only about handing out hygiene kits, but more importantly, building relationships, as she does with Rhonda. We really become sort of like their advocates. You know, we facilitate services for them. Unfortunately, a lot of them have been burned by the system. A lot of them have been given the incorrect information or, you know, unfortunately, some of them have never been informed about the possible resources. Every person they meet is unique. That's why, Brian says, solving homelessness doesn't come down to just one solution. Their needs and, and the trauma and, and the things that they've gone through is all different for all of us, so it takes a different approach. The challenge for Felix and Rhonda, having enough cash for the upfront costs of renting an apartment, an application fee, the security deposit, first and last month's rent, they just don't have that money. And they're not the only ones struggling. About one in five residents in the San Antonio, New Braunfels metro area live in poverty. The minimum wage is $7.25 an hour, only a third of the estimated amount needed for a two-bedroom apartment. Another contributing factor to the lack of affordable housing, more people keep moving into the area, increasing rent and mortgage prices. So for now, Rhonda remains on a wait list for housing. She has to check in with Sam Ministries or the city's homeless hotline every 30 days to make sure her case remains active and her name remains on the list. That is what keeps them on that housing list. That is what pushes them along through this process. This is a very complex and complicated process, sometimes even for service providers, you know, much less for somebody who's just trying to figure out, you know, where am I going to sleep tonight? Housing could take days or months. Despite the challenges, Felix and Rhonda remain positive about their future. We're survivors anyway, but but we want to do better and we want to have something something else. I am Gina Nario Jones. I am 57 years old. Gina Jones is also a survivor. She is one of Sam Ministry's success stories. I am very happy. Uh, I live at the Moxie Apartments uh, by myself with my cat. He keeps me on my feet. But this apartment hasn't always been home. And I became homeless three years ago and I just kept walking up and down San Pedro and seeing a lot of other homeless people started to do the drugs. Gina lived under this bridge along San Pedro Avenue near Jackson Keller for about a year. Her memories fuzzy due to addiction, seizures, and trauma. Mental illness is another common challenge people living on the street face. The South Alamo Regional Alliance for the Homeless, or SARA, is the designated nonprofit that coordinates homeless response for service providers across San Antonio and Bear County. The organization collects data from all providers they work with to get a better idea of who experiences homelessness and why. From January 2020 to January 2021, they found that of the 2013 people engaged through street outreach projects, 71% reported a mental health condition. One of the many reasons why street outreach is crucial. For Gina, her life changed forever in June 2019 when Sam Ministries outreach workers found her. It took them four times before I really woke up. And that's only because they kept going to visit me. And they never gave up. I am here because of them. And these people, strangers not knowing anything about me, what keeps me going in life because they're the ones that taught me what it's about. Sam Ministries helped Gina find this home through the permanent supportive housing program. I color the way I feel. A home decorated with art she's colored. It's become a hobby, a way for her to cope with stress and anxiety. Her seizures are under control and her life is stable, a life she never thought was possible. And she's forever grateful for Sam Ministries. I'm not anybody special, but to them I am. and. I would never let them down because I wouldn't be here, like I said, without them. And although she's called this home for almost two years now, Sam Ministries is still in her life. A case manager continues to build on that relationship, helping Gina on her journey. And while many serving this population say the homeless services system is complex, there are more success stories like Gina's. And over the course of three years, we've connected with almost 800 people. 
um, of that uh, right at 50% have, uh, have been connected to the next higher level of care, whether that's emergency shelter, connection to medical services, connection to mental health, detox, substance abuse, uh, ID recovery, uh, and, and of that almost 800, uh, 120 have been housed in the permanent housing. An issue this complicated is obviously going to be a tough one to address. There is not going to be a one-size-fits-all solution, and there will always be arguments over the best ways to help out. But as R.J. Marquez explains, despite the challenges, homeless service providers keep pushing forward. We showed you some scenes that played out during our time spent with outreach workers earlier in this episode, and it's clear the work they do is challenging and never-ending. So we asked Morgan Hanley with Corazon Ministries how she measures her success. That's a, that's a really good question. So it depends on the client. So in this job, you have to find the little wins. We carry a lot of heavy stuff. You have to find the little wins. Otherwise, it's going to be very dark and you're going to wonder, why do I do this every day? And while there's no easy solution, there is one common goal, helping those in need get off the streets. Housing is what ends homelessness. Um, you know, if people can get into a safe, stable, and affordable housing, um, you know, then we can start working on the other things or the other issues that maybe that come along with them. With that in mind, San Antonio City Council voted in June to lease a downtown hotel to Sam Ministries to operate as a low barrier shelter or a shelter that doesn't have the same requirements others do. This type of shelter can help people suffering from drug addiction who have not gotten sober yet, people who have emotional or behavioral health issues, even registered sex offenders. But sometimes accepting help, even when there are few conditions attached, is hard for people who have been living on the streets for years. For the most part, what you're seeing is people who have been through a lot of traumatic experiences, they've lost their homes, they're disconnected from family, and they feel like they want to give up. We know it takes a while um, for that moment to come where someone has renewed hope and wants to take that step. Um, for a change. And once a person accepts help and shelter, the next step is making sure they stay housed. Data from the city's Department of Human Services shows that in 2019, 773 of 3,000 people who had successfully exited the city's homeless response system two years prior had returned to homelessness. The city's Department of Human Services and the South Alamo Regional Alliance for the Homeless have created a network of local providers to make sure that there's communication and coordination when it comes to helping the homeless across our city. As you can see right now, we're off of Broadway right under I-35 and there are people that have started making a living out here that are living in tents under the highway. So what Sarah and the city did was that back in December, they released a plan in an effort to better respond to homelessness in Bear County. But they say there's also room for help from people who don't do this full time. They say the best way to help is to volunteer with or donate to organizations that have been working with this community for years to build relationships. And so many of these people have been disappointed by life. The system is tough. It can be really hard. So if we have a relationship with them, then we can convince them it's worth it to wait. It's worth it to participate. We can explain it may take two or three months, but stick with me. Um, and you being there day in and day out is very helpful. On her walk along with Morgan and Brittany, after hours of interactions with individuals experiencing homelessness, we meet Stephen. Stephen, you got it? Yeah. You got it? Yeah. All right. How are you doing? I don't have any cigarettes. Are you going to come back to the day center today? We can work on getting you into Haven. Because his walker is broken. I'm going to see if I can come pick him up in the van. I don't expect him to walk like this in the rain. And while many others are hesitant to go to the day center, Morgan and Brittany finally convinced Stephen to go and get a hot meal and a shower. A little victory on a cloudy morning. And I talked to him and I took him to the day center and now he just, like he's not gonna move from there, yeah. you know? Um, it's just been pretty amazing to build that relationship. And then hopefully soon, like he's opened the shelter. So hopefully soon we can get him in there. If you are interested in learning more about ways that you can help out, there are several opportunities to donate or volunteer with organizations all around town. We have the information about those groups right now on our website at ksat.com slash explains. Thanks for joining us for this episode of KSAT Explains. I'm Myra Arthur. We'll see you next time.